Hello, my name is Scott Van Zandt. I'm a clinical professor in the DPT program at Hanover College, and I hate to start this out with an apology. Um, unfortunately, I had the wrong time uh, for the start of this lecture um, written down. And then once I tried to get on, I could not successfully um, open Zoom. Um, for the provided link. So I'm uh, going to provide this recording and uh, hope that uh, I can at least uh, post this. And again, I send my apologies to all of those individuals that were um, uh, looking uh, for this lecture to be at six o'clock, but I thought was actually at seven. So again, my apologies, but uh, let's... Uh, uh, progress on and uh, uh, get to the presentation at hand. So the topic of this lecture is genetic factors uh, influencing cardiovascular disease. And let me give you a little bit of a background. I've uh, uh, got a PhD in exercise physiology. Uh, I've been a uh, physical therapist for almost 25 years. Um, but I was a biology teaching major as an undergraduate. And uh, one course that particularly stuck with me in that preparation was my genetics course. Um, and knowing that genetics is at the base of all physiologic function, I knew intuitively that uh, both exercise performance and health uh, ultimately have a strong genetic component. And with the advent of the human genome, we've seen the ability of what is called precision medicine being developed. And basically that gives the ability of physicians and pharmacists and all health professionals, the potential ability to match the health services that they can provide uniquely to the genetic profile of the patient. And that's where the evolution of this talk uh, ultimately began. And um, so, a little bit about cardiovascular disease. It is a significant health problem in the United States and in all developed nations, actually. Cardiovascular disease encompasses multiple conditions related to the cardiovascular system, including heart disease, hypertension, heart failure, and stroke. It is the leading cause of adult death in the United States. And while the mortality rate of cardiovascular disease has been coming down largely as a result of increased treatment methodologies, it is still a significant health concern. Um, there is a strong genetic component to cardiovascular disease, um, as this data suggests. Uh, looking at the relative mortality risk of adopted individuals and comparing that risk to both their adoptive parent and their biologic parent. And the odds ratio of uh, cause of death, both from natural causes and vascular causes in particular, are considerably elevated um, as it relates to biologic parent cause of death versus adopted parent of death, suggesting a strong genetic influence in um, mortality. Um, so a little background on uh, genetics for those of you that may not be uh, familiar with some of the terminology. You are probably familiar with the fact that uh, the human genome, and the genome is the term that we give to the uh, entire genetic composition of the human individual, 
we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 of which we call autosomes, so they are non-sex uh, related, and one pair of sex chromosomes, X for the female and Y for the male. Uh, so the um, composition in the female as it relates to sex chromosomes would be two X chromosomes, and for the male it would be an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Human genome contains about 30,000 genes, which are made up in themselves of about 3 billion nucleotide bases. And it are these bases that ultimately are the human map, if you will, on how the human body functions. Interestingly, we are all much more similar than we are different. Humans, contain about 99.9% .9 of their genetic makeup is identical. So individual variants of genetic material from person to person is only about 0.1%. Of the human genome, about 2% codes for protein synthesis. So telling the cells what to do and what structure to assume. Uh, much of the remainder is what we refer to as genetic switches that help to influence the function that may turn genes off or turn, turn genes on at a particular time. And about 50% of the genome is what we call repeat sequences. Now this is kind of a, a, a diagrammatic look at what a chromosome might, might look like. This is a, a diagrammic re representation of chromosome two. And so all of the genes are physically housed on this structure. And each gene then is composed of uh, several nu nucleotide bases. And uh, so each, each gene for whatever role it plays is located in a particular place on the chromosome and based on that physical location and uh, staining patterns in the lab, we can identify the exact location on the chromosome of each individual human gene. Each gene has two forms or what we call alleles that express for that given trait. Uh, we obtain one allele for each trait from each of our biologic parents. Um, every trait has what we call a genotype, which is the actual genetic makeup of that trait, and a phenotype, which is actually the visual expression of that particular trait. So if we looked at uh, eye color, for example, um, you may have a genotype that expresses for uh, a, a mixture of alleles. Um, you may have an allele specific for brown and an allele specific for blue eye color. But the phenotype how we visualize that is going to be brown because brown is a dominant allele. And even though you have mixed alleles, the presence of that dominant allele will ultimately define the phenotype. So uh, alleles that are identical are what we call homozygous and alleles that are different are what we call heterozygous. So in the eye color example I previously used, uh, that would be a heterozygous genotype for brown eyes. If the individual had two alleles for blue eye color, they would phenotypically express blue eye color and they would be homozygous for that trait. Another term that's important to know is what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms, or 
uh, more uh, easily called SNPs. And uh, SNPs are portions of the DNA in humans that have a variant allele or a different form of that gene in greater than 1% of the population. Um, a lot of the genetic diseases that we're familiar with like cystic fibrosis or muscular dystrophy or sickle cell disease are what we call monogenic uh, diseases. That is that one gene and one gene only is responsible for that disease process. Single gene mutations are really quite rare. They occur in considerably less than 1% of the population. And so genetic influences for more complex diseases like cancer, like cardiovascular disease, uh, like obesity, are more complex in their genetic makeup. And uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms and uh, haplotypes, which are clusters of these SNPs, are generally thought to be involved in the genetic origins of a lot of the uh, more chronic disease conditions. Um, cardiovascular disease is a significant health problem because it's a multifactorial disease and it's extremely difficult to treat. Um, there are numerous physiologic factors that play into the development of cardiovascular disease. And those are listed here. Um, these are classified uh, by the American Heart Association as the, uh, what we call primary cardiovascular disease risk factors. Those components that research has strongly shown to be related to the development of cardiovascular disease. When we look at the genetic influences, it's important to note that with so many potential risk factors, uh, each of these risk factors likely have thousands or tens of thousands of genetic factors that could impact the development of each one of these risk factors. And then you multiply that by the seven or eight risk factors that are listed here, and you have a significant genetic um, puzzle to figure out relative to uh, the development of cardiovascular disease. Uh, just to take a few examples, male sex, which is obviously genetically influenced, uh, increases cardiovascular disease mortality risk up through the sixth decade of life family history of cardiovascular disease in a first degree relative, those individuals that we share our most common genetic profiles have been shown to significantly increase cardiovascular mortality risk. Body composition. So as we relate this, we'll speak to the risk factor of body mass index and waist circumference because those generally are the clinical definitions that would correlate to overweightness or obesity. Uh, research has shown, uh, especially looking at twin studies, that there is a strong heritability component, anywhere from 25 to 50% of body fat composition is, is genetically based. And at least 127 unique genes have been related to obesity phenotypes in humans. Both monozygotic and dizygotic twin studies suggest that total energy expenditure, uh, which is the amount of energy that we utilize on a day-to-day -day basis and significantly is going to impact our uh, body mass index, our assessment of um, our degree of fatness. Um, that total energy expenditure uh, has a significant genetic component as well, up to 40%. And research has suggested that about 50% of variability 
in individual response to dietary cholesterol intake uh, may be genetically determined as well. So that speaks to this lipid uh, risk factor com component. Um, even physical activity has been shown to be having a genetic influence. Uh, studies that have looked at um, physical activity, self-reported physical activity, and uh, consequent uh, genetic association in monozygotic and dizygotic twins have shown anywhere from 50 to 60% of self-reported physical activity uh, to be consistent with genetic profile. And other studies have reported that up to 37 novel SNPs uh, of distinct genes can influence self-reported physical activity. So you can see that there are a lot of factors that come into play uh, well beyond the scope of this talk or, or in fact, uh, entire classes. But what I would like to do uh, with the remainder of our discussion is to just focus on one particular factor that has been well-researched relative to genetic contribution to cardiovascular disease risk. And that is a molecule called apolipoprotein E or APOE. Um, APOE is a constituent of lipoproteins, those molecules that help transport fat in the blood. Um, and VLDL, that stands for very low density lipoprotein. And HDL, that stands for high density lipoprotein. These are molecules that transport fats in the blood. And uh, APOE plays an important role in helping these lipoproteins uh, do that job. Um, this particular gene, uh, the APOE gene is located on chromosome 17 and it significantly has three polymorphic alleles, what we call epsilon two, three, and four. And uh, epsilon-4 allele uh, has been extensively studied as it relates to cardiovascular disease risk, um, as it relates to both mortality and morbidity of this disease condition. So um, many studies have looked at the impact of the epsilon-4 allele of APOE as it relates to atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Uh, a prominent Finnish study showed that uh, uh, significantly more individuals died over the course of the study that of cardiovascular disease that demonstrated the APOE epsilon-4 uh, poly polymorphism a similar study that looked at morbidity as it relates to cardiovascular disease um, done in Dutch males showed that those that had both alleles for the epsilon-4 were a significantly elevated risk for diabetes compared to those that only had one allele or that did not have the epsilon-4 allele. Uh, a study looked at uh, the APOE allele configuration in centenarians in France and compared them to age similar controls. And they noted that centenarians had a remarkably lower degree of the epsilon-4 allele compared to the controls. The epsilon-3 allele were at were actually identical in both groups. And the centenarians had a significantly higher level of the epsilon two allele. Studies have also shown that the allele configuration can impact how the individual processes dietary fat. Uh, this 
study looked at um, the APOE configuration, epsilon two, three, and four, and changes in fasting plasma total cholesterol in individuals that consumed four diets um, from high fat, the Tyrol diet, to very low fat in the Sudanese diet and intermediate fat levels in, in uh, Finland and Japan-based diets. Basically what this demonstrated was that um, the change in plasma cholesterol um, in those individuals that had the epsilon allele was, was entirely positive regardless of the diet that was consumed, but it was considerably higher when a high fat diet was consumed. In individuals with the epsilon three allele, there was little if any change in their plasma cholesterol level, but significantly in those with the epsilon two, and remember that that was the allele that was significantly higher in the centenarians in the French study, uh, all plasma levels were decreased. Um, APOE has been studied as it relates to other cardiovascular conditions, specifically stroke. Um, APOE is uh, the most abundant brain, brain lipoprotein, and it has been shown to... Uh, the epsilon-4 allele has been shown to adversely affect neural tissue repair and recovery uh, when you have uh, conditions that impair brain function like a stroke. Um, a study done by Alberts, uh, a small study, uh, but significant looking at uh, patients that suffered a stroke and also assessed their uh, APOE configuration and identified that those individuals that had the epsilon-4 allele had significantly poorer outcomes um, based on function, which is measured by the Barthel score uh, post-treatment. Another study uh, looked at the presence of the APO-4 allele as it related to individuals that uh, suffered a neurismal subarachnid hemorrhage and found that a, those with the APOE4 allele had considerably uh, more unfavorable out outcomes than did those without 40% versus 19%. Um, that results in a, an unfavorable outcome uh, odds ratio of about 2.8. So if if an odds ratio of one is considered equal, um, then those individuals with the APO4 allele, uh, their, their odds ratio was considerably higher at 2.8. And when the data was corrected for other influencing factors like age and rebleeding risk, clinical status, that odds ratio increased up to 7.1. Uh, so the epsilon-4 allele had a uh, strong, statistically significant impact on um, um, having an unfavorable outcome relative to uh, stroke. Um, another interesting study looking at the impact of the epsilon-4 allele on stroke recovery was done by Kramer and colleagues. Uh, and what was Interesting about this study was that it was a large study, uh, over 255 subjects, um, but the original origins of the study was specifically looking at uh, functional outcome from stroke treatment and genetic analysis of uh, the APOE allele was actually done secondarily from tissues that had, had been um, previously uh, collected. So this, this, this wasn't the focus of the study, but it was an ancillary component to it. And from the results, um, 
it was quite striking the impact that the APOE uh, allele configuration had. So when they looked at um, the level of disability in these subjects three months post-stroke, they assessed the degree of subjects that had minimal or no disability and looked at their APOE polymorphism configuration. And in those that had an absent configuration, there was a significantly higher number of individuals that had minimal or no disability compared to those that had the APOE4 allele present. So what does this tell us as it relates to how we can look at treating cardiovascular disease from a genetic perspective? Well, beyond the fact that it's going to be very difficult, um, it may help to give us a better appreciation for the relationship between broad disease phenotypes like cardiovascular disease or hypertension or cancer or obesity. And the individual genes that make up that. And this is kind of a theoretic model on how we might approach that. So if we consider cardiovascular disease as a broad phenotype, uh, a broad statement of how we physiologically express, we need to understand that there are multiple intermediate phenotypes that impact that. So one could be physical inactivity. One could be uh, metabolism. One could be obesity. And these intermediate phenotypes then are impacted by both genetic specific gene configurations and experimental or what we could also call environmental factors that influence the expression of that gene. And so you have kind of a cascade effect of genes being influenced by environmental or experimental factors that ultimately influence the expression of an intermediate phenotype. And then the sum of these intermediate phenotypes feed into the broad phenotype expression. So how does the recent advances in gene therapy impact the ability to treat more complex diseases? And a short answer is it doesn't help a lot. Um, Recent treatment methodologies that you've likely heard of, which include vector introduction of therapeutic genes. So, so taking some kind of, of attenuated virus or nanoparticle and uh, using that as a carrier for a therapeutic gene that can be introduced to uh, the body and uh, help to repair the uh, genetic error, or you may have heard of the technique called CRISPR case nine, which is uh, actually derived from bacteria, which is a means by which bacteria use to uh, protect themselves against virus. Actually, they can use it to splice out viral uh, genetic material. And uh, we've been able to uh, utilize this, uh, this bacterial technology, if you will, uh, to be able to splice out uh, adverse gen genetic material in human cells and introduce either therapeutic, synthetic genetic material, or just allow the gene to repair itself without that aired uh, genetic material. And while these techniques have been used effectively 
in single gene uh, or monogenic disease conditions. Um, the ability to use these techniques in a much more complex disease condition that has these multiple gene influences on multiple intermediate phenotypes uh, that ultimately impact the broad phenotype, it's gonna be a difficult road to hoe. But, but the more we learn about what genes are involved in the disease process that lead up to intermediate phenotype development and broad phenotype development, it may allow us to help mitigate at least some of the individual genetic components and make our long-term treatment of cardiovascular disease and other chronic disease conditions much easier. Um, any questions that you might have, uh, please submit them by email. Uh, and I would uh, be remiss if I didn't identify uh, the stellar contributions of the DPT students that uh, helped in the research and uh, um, putting this whole package together. Uh, Sydney Brown, Amy Joy Delaney, Trevor Duncan, Koshi John, Daniel Moorhead, Caitlin Napoli, Jasmine Sanchez, Lexi Van Bali, Andrew West, and Shania Young. I thank you very much. And again, my apologies for um, not being uh, present at the designated time. Hopefully this recording will uh, assist in uh, providing you a little information. Thank you very much.